Good afternoon. My name is Carl Stark. I'm assistant managing editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I oversee business news and health coverage. And I want to welcome you all to Cancer Precision Medicine, Big Ideas in Research, Treatment, and Prevention. This is a curated walkthrough of the cutting edge of cancer care. We have an amazing cast here today to lay that out. We are joined uh, by the heads of six cancer centers in Pennsylvania, the first time we've assembled this group on one stage. We live in amazing times. Never, never before have we understood so much and been able to do so much, and never have we had a better understanding of what remains to be done and the considerable challenges that patients still face. So the American Association uh, for Cancer Research is the first cancer organization to be formed in the world. And it is the largest cancer organization, cancer research organization, dedicated to accelerating uh, the prevention and cure of cancer. We have been bringing together scientists in all relevant disciplines for more than 100 years. There's really never been a more exciting time. I've been in the field for decades, and I can say that I wake up every morning uh, being so excited about uh, the future and where we are today in this field. Because of the uh, major new technologies that are really facilitating and catapulting us into the new era of drug discovery, innovative treatments, and cancer precision medicine. Ooh, the legend has it that anyone who bathed in the fountain of youth or drank its waters would enjoy immortality. Well, if you actually look at the data, we've not exactly achieved immortality, but we've made some progress. Everything we do at Janssen Now is based on our belief that through medical innovation, we can create a world without disease. The way that we'll realize the vision is through a deep understanding of the diseases that are incubating, then prevent, intercept, or cure them. And if we do this, our products will be better than most. I really think that we are at a crossroads. For the first time in many years, there is renewed national interest in cancer, in cancer care, and in really leveraging what we have learned through many years of basic and applied cancer research to really obtain meaningful uh, clinical gains. So taking the patient's uh, information that we learn at clinical exam, their blood work, looking at PSA screening, other um, factors associated with that patient's health, and then sitting together multiple times a week as a multidisciplinary group with radiation oncology, surgical oncology, um, the urologist, um, and, and having these discussions of what's best on the, in this case for this individual patient. And we found that that has led to much better outcomes for these patients compared to national averages. So we really think that that's the way to go in this complex screening environment. The cornerstone of treatment for many common cancers is surgery um, and radiation therapy. And our surgery oncologists and our radiation oncologists are just as focused on precision medicine as we're talking about here today. Um, you know, the radiation oncologists have amazing technology, which allows them to really sculpt the area of cancer that they want to aim at um, and really try to spare the accompanying normal tissue. In the same way, our surgeons are able to be much more precise. And you know, they're beginning to limit their surgery. This year, I'd like to see whether or not we can get hints out of the clinic of what we've seen in animals, which is that we can take an animal that's a non-responder to an immunotherapy and convert it to a responder just by changing the fecal bacteria in that animal. It's really remarkable, and it suggests that if it was possible, a surgeon might intervene to do a fecal transplant and then hand off to the oncologist with the hopes of seeing a much better response to a patient that was non-responding. To me, that's a really exciting and maybe rapid impact kind of prospect. We need to share data about precision, we call it precision medicine, the choice of therapy, and show that, in fact, the outcome ends up saving money, like what you're saying right now. And one of the examples I think that's done very well in the state of Pennsylvania is that the clinical pathways that's developed at Pittsburgh, where you actually measure what you do with patients and what the outcomes are. And we can do the same thing with expensive drugs and get the data out there and say, this actually is effective for specific patients and it saves money in the, in the long run. Remember that when smoking was being accused or thought of as causing diseases, remember the behavior of big tobacco, okay? And all the way down hiding data and all kinds of things. There is a history of certain things not going well in corporate structure when lots of money is involved. The paradigm needs to shift.
to proving something safe before we allow our children to use it. So when she was diagnosed, um, I can remember picking her up in, in the emergency room, and I said, you know, Emily, only the strongest kids are picked to fight cancer, and no matter what happens, you will beat this cancer. There was times, you know, when, the, when some of the doctors in the PICU felt like she couldn't make it through the night. Um, but Dr. Grupp and the, and the people at Penn worked around the clock to figure out what was going wrong. He came in one morning after we were told the night before that, you know, it was pretty pretty slim chance she could survive, and Emily kept fighting. And uh, Dr. Grupp came in the morning and said, hey, we've figured out that the IL-6 protein in her um, system is super elevated, and uh, we'd like to try the drug tocilizumab to try to turn her around. So we gave her the drug, and then within like 12 hours, she went from I think at one time we counted there were 17 IV pumps keeping her alive. And <clears throat> she started to get better right after that shot. 